Well, good evening, everyone. We have a massive subject to consider. And what I want to do tonight, really, is look at all the different types of prophecy which run through Scripture. We can't spend a lot of time on any of them, really. So re this is really a broad brush approach, if you can put it that way, to show what amazing things are revealed to us in the word of Scripture as far as prophecy is concerned. Now, just at the beginning, we say here that um, there are two types of prophecy. We've called them forth-telling and foretelling. There are those prophecies which simply state the facts. As an example, Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it, he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There's a statement of truth. But it's not telling us anything about the future. So what we're saying is, that is foretelling. An example of foretelling we put there in the same prophecy, Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. So that prophecy is telling us what will happen in the last days. And while we're thinking about this, let's consider what that means because when we look at these we're calling them here end time prophecies we read last days latter days time of the end it could be referring to one of two periods of time it could refer to the end of the jewish nation in 70 a.d or it could refer to we call it here the end of the gentile times the times in which we live. And sometimes it refers to both. So that's something that we need to bear in mind as we go along. Right, so let's with what we might call a framework prophecy. And here we've got a prophecy which, which spans literally thousands and thousands of years. If we just skim through it quickly, uh, following Babylon, which was when the prophecy was given in the days of the kingdom of Babylon, Daniel told the king there will be three more kingdoms to dominate Israel. And so there were. Each kingdom would have an inferior ruler when compared to its predecessor. Nebuchadnezzar was represented by the gold and then comes silver and bronze and so on. So each time the metal becomes less valuable, if we can put it that way. And if we had time, we could show that each time the, the, the power and the authority of the ruler gradually becomes less and less. Daniel told the king that the fourth kingdom would not be replaced by a fifth, but that it would be divided and broken. And interestingly enough, that is exactly what happened. So here Daniel is actually speaking history in advance before it happened. And the weakest of all governments would exist in that broken state. Because now we're down to the feet, which are a mixture of iron and clay, the very weakest material in this image. But there will still be Roman element there represented by the iron. And once again, if we had time, we could show how that that is exactly the state that we see the world in today. So we are in, in this prophecy, in the days of the, the feet of this image, this image of a man, which represents man's kingdom. But eventually, man's kingdom will be replaced by God's kingdom. And that's what the show in the days of these kings shall the god of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed not like babylon or, or persia or greece or rome it will never be destroyed 
And this is the kingdom of God. It will stand forever. And it was represented by a stone hitting that image on its feet. And the image representing man's kingdom comes crashing down to the ground. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, says Daniel, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So what does that stone represent? And it's when we go into the Gospels that, that Jesus tells us that he represents, he's represented by that stone. He says, whosoever shall fall on that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So there we've got a framework prophecy, and I'm afraid we've got to leave it there, because there are other things that we'll... What about prophecies relating to the nation of Israel? We could once again spend all night looking at this. But let's just go through it quickly. We've given four headings here. A date when the prophecy was given, the Bible reference, events prophesied, and when it was fulfilled. So in 1500 before Christ, BCE, before the Common Era, Moses said that because of disobedience, the Jews will be scattered worldwide. And it happened in AD 70. He said that the Jews will be persecuted worldwide. And that has happened down through the ages. And we've all heard the legend of the wandering Jew, haven't we? How that the Jews were, were hounded around from one country to another, never having uh, rest for the sole of their feet, as, as the prophecy said. But, see, another prophet here, Jeremiah, he said that the Jews would return to their ancient homeland. Against all the odds, this has happened. Against the odds, the nation of Israel now exists in the world once again. So, these things concerning the nation of Israel, one by one, have all been fulfilled. Not only the people of Israel, but even the land of Israel. Prophecy said that when the nation of Israel were out of that land, it would be desolate. But when they returned, it would become fruitful again. And it's happened. We say, well, how did these prophets know that? Other than the fact that the author of all these prophecies is, of course, the God of heaven. It didn't stop there. You see, the prophet Zechariah said that when the Jews came back to their ancient homeland, it would be a big problem for every nation of the world. And we say, well, is this true? When we look at the Middle East, that intractable problem, particularly centered around the city of Jerusalem, we say, is it a problem? Uh, it's Wikipedia who lists 30 different attempts by different nations to solve that problem. Then the Bible said it would not be solved until the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth. And then, of course, when the Jews return, the prophets said there will be other signs as well, and we'll come back to those uh, in a moment. So we note here, all these things are happening either today or in the future. So it's exciting as far as we are concerned, is it? So what is the purpose of Bible prophecy? number of purposes, really. First of all, what is it not for? It's not so that we can go around saying, well, we think in such and such a date, something will happen. That's not what it's for at all. It's not to enable us to foretell future dates. And many have tried to do that, of course. And the Bible tells us that it's not the thing to do. You see, prophecy is not for those just with kind of a passing interest. We call it here idle curiosity. 
or as scripture says, those with itching ears. Oh, it's nice to think about these things. It's amazing, isn't it? But there's more to it than that. You see, the full wonder of prophecy only comes when we start comparing scripture with scripture. One prophecy with another. And we'll look at an example of that as we go along. You see, it increases the faith of those who have read these prophecies and understand them when they see them being fulfilled before their very eyes. It, it gives us what we call vision here, for the Bible tells us where there is no vision, the people perish. So those who get interested in Bible prophecy have a vision of the future, and a glorious vision it is. Is it God's servants can look to the future with confidence? What an amazing thing that is in these days when nobody really, humanly speaking, knows what's going to happen next. But those who read their Bibles have a sure and certain hope. They can look forward in absolute confidence to what God has foretold in the pages of Scripture. I suppose most of all it helps God's servant to prepare for that great day when the Lord Jesus Christ will return. Three unchangeable principles when we think about prophecy. Isaiah 46, I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. This is the God who knows the end from the beginning. While well, we have difficulty predicting what the weather, weather might be like tomorrow, don't we? But the God of Israel knew thousands and thousands of years ago exactly what he would do, and that purpose is being outworked in the earth. It's the prophet Daniel again who says, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Once again, it all comes from God. All things are of God, we read in Scripture. And I suppose the third one is, and that's an interesting one, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So God tells the prophets what he's going to do before he does it, so that we can see where we fit, as it were, into his timetable. Well, that a very interesting uh, prophecy uh, that we'll look at in a moment. It's in the book of Revelation. We're going to dip our toes into Revelation because that has been described as the pinnacle of Bible prophecy. So there's the first verse of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And this amazing prophecy has been doing that for 2,000 years, showing things that will shortly come to pass. The verse concludes, he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. That word signified, it means to give a sign or a symbol. So there's something else that we, we come across in many prophecies. There are signs and symbols. So sometimes things are not literal, as we shall see, but they are in sign or symbol. Also in the first chapter of that prophecy, it says, Blessed is he that reads, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The word means nigh at hand. The time when God will establish his kingdom is at hand. And you might be thinking, well, that was written 2,000 years ago. We'll come to that as we go along. Let's consider just one small example from that amazing prophecy. We say here it's an example that was fulfilled 100 years ago. It showed the servants of God 
what would shortly come to pass. But they had to search the scriptures to understand the symbols, and so they were blessed. Well, let's look at that example, shall we? There's a, a newspaper cutting. Looks a bit old and dingy because it is. It's, hundred year, it's over 100 years old. We note it's taken from the Sheffield Weekly News, April the 7th, 1917, just over 100 years ago. And that newspaper were running a series called Apostolic Faith and Practice. And they sent a reporter to the Christadelphians to see what they were saying a hundred years ago. Well, it, it's impossible to, to read that, isn't it? But some of it out here, let's, so let's put it in a bit clearer format. This is what the reporter said. Last Sunday, after the reading, followed a prayer. One special feature of that was a request for the regathering of the Jews to the Holy Land and to the city of Jerusalem. He says, once or twice during the morning, I noticed this prayer for the regathering of the house of Israel. A hundred years ago, they were praying for the return of the Jews. Because a hundred years ago, the nation did not exist. But they knew that one day it would. He says, they teach that Christ will destroy the powers that at present corrupt the earth and re-establish the whole nation of Israel in Jehovah's land, now trodden underfoot by the Ottoman power. And that's the state that it was in at that stage. The Middle East was dominated by the, the Turkish Ottoman power. Uh, and they were praying that that might change so that, that Israel might return to their land in accordance with Bible prophecy. Let's just have a quick look at the, the one verse, the verse that they took that idea from. It's in Revelation chapter 16. And at verse 12. It says there, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. You say, what on earth does that mean? What's all that about? River Euphrates, kings of the earth, what's it all about? And the only way they could find out what it was all about was to compare scripture with scripture. And that is exactly what they did. They had to search to find out what a river drying up symbolizes because these are symbols. What does it mean, a river drying up? And they will go to passages like this one in Isaiah. You see, here's, here's one of the clues. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory. So here we've got a verse that tells us what a river represents. The river represented the king of Assyria and all his glory, all his armies. He shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. He shall pass through Judah and overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck. And that's exactly what happened shortly after Isaiah spoke those words. But we can see here, right from this verse, what the river represents. This was a river that was overflowing its banks. In Revelation, it was a river that was doing the opposite. It was So they had to look for a power that was gradually drying up. You see, every symbol in Revelation, well, all of the Bible for that matter, is so accurate. A river doesn't dry up in a couple of hours, does it? It's a long, long, slow process. And that's exactly what we have here. Now here we've got a map. It shows the contraction of the Ottoman Empire. And we can see that in stages, the map shows how that they lost territory uh, between 1800 and 1877. They lost territory between 1878 and 1913. Until when we get to the lights of the First World War, it's under the, the green parts on that map that... Turkey still held on to 
that they could see it had to dry up more yet. They knew that it had to dry up more yet because Israel had to be established in the land of Israel. Many prophecies foretold that. So, we just highlighted the river Euphrates there on that map. See, the prophecy was accurate. The river Euphrates, the, the power that rep was represented by the river Euphrates was gradually drying up uh, over this long period of time. Let's go back to the newspaper, shall we? The reporter said, it is very interesting to read in one article of their creed that we are living in the period of the sixth vial. We've just read that, haven't we? In which Christ appears again on the theatre of mundane events and that one of the great and notable signs of the times is the drying up of the Ottoman Empire. They could see what was happening and they were getting excited as well because they knew that this was showing that soon the Lord Jesus Christ will be back in the earth. The reporter goes on to say here, for we know today how near our troops are to the city of Jerusalem and how each moment is bringing us nearer to the complete overthrow of the Ottoman power. He says, what they said years ago, he says, you can see it happening now. And it was that same year that General Allenby walks into Jerusalem to liberate Jerusalem from the Turks and to pave the way for the nation of Israel returning to their ancient homeland. The reporter goes on to say, when I read this special article of the Christadelphian Creed previous to attending their meeting, I felt very much interested. For it was written years and years ago. And it is wonderful to think that in our day, a part of its prediction is being fulfilled. He says, they knew years and years ago that this was going to happen. And he said, we can see it taking place now. And, and, and that's not a Bible student saying that. That's a reporter from a newspaper. Here's another example. First World War uh, Ecclesia here has a free Bible lantern lecture. No computers in those days, but they had a free Bible lantern lecture. The uprise and decline of Turkey, a great sign of Christ's return. So this is, this is in Turkey, actually. They were saying the same thing. At the bottom of that leaflet there, it says, The decline of the Turkish Empire and the growth of Zionism in Palestine is all in accordance with the forecast of Bible prophecy. They could see that things were happening. The, the prophecy spoke about centuries and centuries earlier. And then, of course, comes what is known as the Balfour Declaration, when the government of Britain favoured the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. It all happened the same year. And as we say, they were getting excited. This is what... One Bible student said, what, 70 years before it happened? He says, I know not whether the men who control the foreign policy of Britain entertain the idea of assuming sovereignty of the Holy Land and of promoting its colonisation by Jews. Their present intentions are of no importance one way or the other because they will be compelled by events soon to happen that what under ex existing circumstances heaven and earth could not move them to attempt. You see what he's saying? It looks at that time when he was writing that article that there's no way Britain was going to get involved. But he says, prophecy tells us that they will. He didn't know when, but he knew that one day Britain would become involved. And we see how detailed Bible prophecy is, don't we? Well, here's a hymn that was written at the same time during the First World War. And we see how that this buoyed them up. They were living in the middle of the First World War. And what does the hymn say? Lift up your head, ye saints, redemption draweth nigh. What though the waters rage and roar, and they were, because waters represent nations and people, faith laughs at every fear. They, they knew that what was happening in the world at that time 
was foretelling the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. What though the way be dark, the heavenly light is clear. What though the night is black with storm, which it was. They knew that deliverance was near. Whereas other people were full of foreboding, wondering what this terrible, how this terrible war was going to end. And there we see the way in which Bible prophecy can help. It can buoy people up, those who have faith in, in what God is doing. The next verse starts, Mark how the signs abound when spring is on the way. And we say, well, that at least three signs showing the return of Jesus was near. The Turkish Empire drying up, the growth of Zionism in Palestine, and now Britain's declaration to help the Jews. And there were possibly one or two other signs as well at that time. The hymn goes on to say, See how the gleam grows in the east. And we look at the artwork on that poster. There's the sun just popping up under the horizon in the east. Because that, of course, is, is where the sun does rise. So they say, in the world they night, behold the portents plain that speak the coming of the king, the glories of his reign. Or they... They were excited. They knew that the king was coming to solve all the problems that were in the world at that time. What does, what does the kings of the east mean? So here again, they had to find out what, what does that mean, the kings of the east? That the way the kings of the east might be prepared. And so they got their concordances out and found out what that word East actually is in the original. Two words, Anatol and Helios. Anatol, the rising of the sun of the stars. And we've got verses like Malachi chapter 4. Unto you that fear my name shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. as a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. What about the word Helios? It means the sun or rays of the sun. It's used in, in Matthew chapter 13 where Jesus says, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. So when Jesus comes to reign on the earth, he won't be on his own. The righteous will be reigning with him as the sun. It's interesting that the Young's literal translation translates that phrase, that the way of the kings who are from the rising of the sun may be made ready. Three passages there, put them all together, and it was giving them an idea of, of what exactly was happening there. And there's an example. It's not just looking at one verse and say, well, can you see what that means? Sometimes we have to go to different places of scripture, as on this example. But that wasn't the end of it, was it, this verse? The way the kings of the east might be prepared. Preparations were being made here. They knew that when Jesus returned, the Middle East would not be dominated by the Turkish Empire. They knew that at that time, the nation of Israel would be back. They could see that preparations were being made here. Uh, and we are, what, 100 years on? And we can see what's happened. So what we're saying is, verse 3 of Revelation 1, Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of those, this prophecy. They read the prophecy. They had, to quote Jesus, ears to hear. They searched out the meaning. And so they were blessed, as the prophecy promises, they were blessed being encouraged by seeing God at work amongst the nations and their faith was increased and they were the more ready to be prepared for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You might say, just a minute, that was 100 years ago. And still Jesus has not returned. Did the prophecy mislead them? This is the wonder of Bible prophecy. It didn't mislead them at all. It prepared them for the coming of the king. You see, they are all asleep now in the dust of the earth. And when they awake, the king will be here. 
And this is the amazing thing about this final prophecy. You see, we read, for example, in the last chapter of it, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the saying to the prophecy of this book. And he says again in the same chapter, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. And yet again, in the second last verse of the Bible, he says, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Even so, come Lord Jesus, John adds at the end there. What did he mean? 2,000 years. Quickly, it's not very quickly at all, is it? I think what the prophecy is saying, really we've only got a lifetime to be prepared for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we don't know when that life will end either, do we? So we need to be ready, we need to be prepared at all times. And what about the prophecy today? I'm afraid we've got to just skim through this very quickly. Verse 12 is now in the past, that's history. The way has been prepared. And John says, I th saw three unclean spirits. And if we had time, we could identify them. They were like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the beast and the false prophet. They are the spirits of devils or madness, working miracles. And we could show exactly that all these things are being, they're, they're all symbols. If we had time, we could show that what we've got there, in two sentences, this prophecy accurately describes, in symbol, the age in which we live. And perhaps we can look at that some other time. They go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. That's the battle of Armageddon. And we'll come back to that at the end. So we might say, why, why make it so complicated? Surely, why not just say things as they are? And that's why we had that reading from Matthew chapter 13. And there the Lord Jesus Christ was asked the question, why do you speak in parables? And the answer was, so that those who really want to know will find out. Those who don't won't find out. And here once again we say is, is the wonder of Bible prophecy. So that's Matthew 13. You see, Proverbs says, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honour of kings is to search out a matter. We note it doesn't say, the honour of kings is to find out all the answers. Because Bible prophecy is such that we shall never find out all the answers, but we need to search and we need to dig to find out all that God is telling us. Shall we? They've got a list of, you probably can't see the detail, 34 signs that Jesus is about to return. It's available at the end of the meeting if you'd like one. A list of those signs. And many of them are in symbol. Let's just pick out one or two. Daniel says, at the time of the end, knowledge would be increased. Well, has it was Richard Buckminster Fuller who created what he called the knowledge doubling curve. He found out that until 1900, human knowledge doubled approximately every century. By the end of World War II, it was doubling every 25 years. Now, it's doubling every 13 months. And IBM predicts that eventually it will double every 12 hours. We say, is knowledge being increased? Why, of course it is. There's the verse, knowledge shall be increased, Daniel says. And, and there's another passage which, which hints at that as well. Ever learning and never able to come to knowledge of the truth. Learn about anything other than the truth. 
And we've got a book there which has been produced recently. It's called The Death of Truth. Because truth doesn't matter anymore, you know. That's, that's the age in which we live. You just make up your own truth. It doesn't matter if it's different to someone else. I really, it's absolute madness when you think about it. Well, there's that list. In the same verse, Daniel said there will be an increase in travel. He said men will run to and fro. And we say, is that? Here the telegraph shows us the world's busiest airports. And starting with um, Hartsfield Jackson in Atlanta. They deal with 104 million passengers every year. Now, let's just try and translate this with bigger figures as well, shall we? Every day, that airport deals with 285,000 passengers. If we translate that to hours, every hour it deals with 11,872 passengers. Uh, and here we've got just 10 airports. If we add together the totals, that comes to over 2 million passengers a day, which equates to uh, 90,000 an hour, which equates to 1,500 every minute. And we say, is travel increasing? It surely is. That's only 10 airports. And there are 17,000 commercial airports in the world. And what about train travel and coach travel and car travel? You know, every second of every minute of every day of every year, there are thousands and thousands of people dashing here, there and everywhere. I know we sometimes say when we're on the M1, where are they all going? You know, they're all moving around and who knows where. There's the verse in Daniel. Seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And so we see it happening, do we not, in the world. There's just some of the routes. They're the domestic routes in USA and Canada. Let's go to the other side of this chart, shall we? It talks there about preparations for war. There's the US federal budget for this year. You probably can't read all, all the small writing, but we've highlighted two things. For defense, US uses 54.5% of its total budget. On agriculture, it spends 1.7%. We know from prophecy that's got to change. Because ultimately men will beat their swords into plowshares that the prophecies tell us. What about the other big superpower? Putin is preparing for World War Three, says Newsweek, uh, the back end of last year. The Economist says Russia's biggest war game in Europe since the Cold War war alarms NATO and so it should. The estimate 100,000 Russian troops were taking place in that war game. And then we learn it wasn't a game after all, it wasn't a game at all. Because the troops are not going to go home, they're going to remain in, in position as the Express tells us. We say are they preparing for war? How about this? This is the biggest bomb in the history of the world. They call it Big Ivan. It's 1,400 times stronger than the bombs that destroyed Nagasaki and Hiroshima put, to to put together. It doesn't bear thinking about, does it? One bomb can do all that damage. So, yes, the world is preparing for war and Many people are indeed apprehensive as to what the future holds. But when we look at Bible prophecy, we know once again where it's leading. These are all signs telling us that the return of Jesus 
Let's look at just one more. We call this here earthquake threat in Israel and worldwide. And to go to this one, we need to go to our Bible because it's not on the screen. It's in Ezekiel chapter 38. Interestingly enough, something like 14 of the signs that we have on the screen are taken from this one chapter, which describes the nation of Russia, how that it will attack the Middle East and particularly the nation of Israel. But if we look at Ezekiel 38 and at verse 18, we read, it shall come to pass at the same time when go shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. God will say, enough is enough. My fury will come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of heaven, beasts of the field and creeping things that creep on the earth, and all the men that are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. So Ezekiel is describing a massive earthquake which is going to take place in the land of Israel. We do note that the end result of this is in the last verse of the chapter. God says, Thus will I magnify myself, I will sanctify myself, I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. You see, at the moment, the nations don't want to know anything about God, but they will know. This is Ezekiel's refrain, isn't it? The nations shall know that there is a God in Israel. So when we think about this, it's in the prophet Zechariah. His feet shall stand in that day, and it's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. It's interesting that there was a publication made in Israel called the Survey of Israel. And here we've shown just part of one of the maps. It's the area around Jerusalem. Uh, and every black line on the map represents a fault line. See that fault line there? It runs right through Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. And we say, how did the prophets know that this was going to happen? Israel are very worried about this. There's just one example. Back in 2008, they say, if a quake hits between 8 a.m. and 1 p.m., a whole generation will be lost because they discovered that all the primary schools are built on this fault line. And there are other examples to show that this is an ongoing thing in Israel. They know that it's coming. They don't know when. But there's another fault line, which is even more important. There's a quote from the, the mayor of Tiberias. He says, we are living on borrowed time. It could happen any second. But it's that fault line there, which is known as the Great Rift Valley. We can see just a little bit of it there. It starts down in Africa and it goes right up into Turkey. It's one of the major fault lines. And God says, all flesh will shake. Let's translate this to the world now, shall we? And there's a map that shows us the major fault lines. And we can see the one that runs through the nation of Israel. Very small on the map. It separates the African plate and the Arabian plate. But all flesh will shake at my presence says God. We believe that we are right on the eve of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know that we are very close. 
Just think, 100 years ago, they had, what, three or four signs. Now we've got 34 signs, and I think, I'm sure we could add more, actually, if, if we started digging further. Jesus says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. You see, that's the verse after the, the one that we looked at earlier on. He gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And what does it say next? There were voices and thunders and lightnings. There was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were on the face of the earth. So mighty an earthquake, and so great. And I believe that that earthquake is going to be a physical earthquake, a political earthquake, and a religious earthquake. Things will never be the same again, because the Lord Jesus Christ will be here. And these things surely prepare us for that. They're not. Jesus says, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. Surfeiting and drunkenness. It was used in the language of the Old Testament prophets. Not literal drunkenness, but spiritual drunkenness. Not knowing what was happening. In the same way that someone who is literally drunk doesn't know what's happening around about them. Jesus says, Beware that you're not like that. And it's prophecy that prepares us for this day. Verse 35. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all those things that shall come to pass. And to stand before the Son of Man. How blessed we are to have the words of prophecy. Which give us the warnings that Jesus is at the doors. And we pray, don't we, that when he does come, we may all be ready and waiting for that great day.